So, hello everyone, and welcome to my talk. As uh, John said, I'm going to talk about China's digital yuan. So basically, I'm going to talk about the digital yuan, but as I said, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you want afterwards, in case you have like any additional doubt that you want me to solve. I'm going to start by uh, introducing the topic very briefly. Then I'm going to talk about what CBDCs are, the main CBDC projects around the world, the digital yuan, and then I'm going to conclude by, by adding some, some final remarks. So, first of all, I'm not going to dwell on, on myself for much uh, longer because this part is not as interesting for you. Simply, I want you to know that I'm quite involved in this uh, CBDC area. I'm constantly like um, giving talks on this topic and advising um, fintech and blockchain related companies. So that's what you need to know. When it comes to the topic, uh, well, what you need to know is um, basically, before starting, that China started to test the digital yuan last year in April after more than six years of uh, research. So that's a basic idea that you need to get before like um, digging deeper on this topic. So let's talk first about central bank digital currencies, what CBDCs exactly are, etc. cetera. Um, central bank digital currencies are a kind of central bank money. And central bank money is a legal tender issued by a central bank, which represents a claim against that central bank. So that's like the first uh, thing you need to know. A CBDC is nothing else but a digital version of that central bank money. In other words, whenever we talk, for example, about the digital yuan or the digital euro, we are doing nothing else but talking about the digital version of the yuan and euro that already exist. So as you can see, this is a different concept when compared, compare, for example, to cryptocurrencies. All CBDCs need to have two um, key aspects. They need to be digital, otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about central bank digital currencies. And in both cases, in, in all cases, sorry, CBDCs represent a liability against a central bank. And this is so because, as we saw before, CBDCs are going to be central bank money. There are multiple uh, motivations behind CBDCs. It's been like um, discussed a lot the, fa the fact that uh, CBDCs can actually replace physical banknotes, which is something that during the pandemic has gained traction, this idea, and that's true. But at the same time, to me, the main motivations behind CBDC are others, such as, for example, monetary policy reasons, improving financial stability, uh, promoting financial inclusion, global geopolitics, financial crime prevention. Actually, this reason of uh, promoting financial inclusion might be very useful when, for Africa, for example, in the future, when starting to, to do research on CBDCs, because uh, as you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, same as India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, have like a very large amount of unbanked people. And in that sense, CBDCs may play a pivotal role when it comes to promoting financial inclusion and allowing more people to become part of the financial system. It's also very important to remark that CBDCs are not cryptocurrencies in the sense that the rationale behind both is actually the opposite. CBDCs are centralized per se, because as I said before, CBDCs <clears throat> are central bank money, which means that they are legal tender, issued by a central bank, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas cryptocurrencies are part of this movement known as DeFi, decentralized finance, which means that the idea, the rationale behind cryptos is precisely the opposite. It's precisely not to be controlled. At the same time, CBDCs are not cryptos also, because they are responding to different realities. While CBDCs are central bank money, legal tender, etc., cryptocurrencies are, until now, mostly digital assets. And it's very rare to find ways to, like, let's say, for example, make day-to-day -day payments by using cryptocurrencies. I'm not saying that it's impossible because that's changing. We've started to see, for example, Visa and MasterCard accepting, uh, and PayPal in the US as well, um, transactions in cryptocurrencies to some extent. But until today, cryptos are more like well, digital assets that that are seen by people right? more like an investment. No? So the idea, the, the main like, rationale behind like, CBDCs and that of cryptocurrencies is actually, as uh, we just saw, the opposite in many ways. Even though it doesn't mean that technically speaking, CBDCs are like very different from cryptos because CBDCs, they get some some uh, technical features from cryptocurrencies. For example, when it comes to digital yuan, 
CBDC, Digital Yuan is going to use both online and hardware wallets. And it's also going to use a two-key architecture system to secure transactions. And those are features typical from cryptocurrencies. At the same time, CBDCs do not need necessarily to use blockchain, but it might be useful for them to do so. And for example, when we look at the case of the digital yuan, we see that it's going to operate through what we call a two-tier structure in which there are two different levels. On a first level, the China Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, is going to issue the digital yuan to the, to the commercial banks without using blockchain. But on a second level, those commercial banks are going to issue the digital yuan to the general public through the use of blockchain. So that's why we can not say that the digital one is not going to be using blockchain. It's going to use blockchain just to some extent. You can see on this slide as well, uh, some images of the wallet apps um, which uh, use uh, for digital one and which were designed by the Cultural Bank of China. So moving forward, now that I already told you what CBDCs are very briefly, I'm going to tell you a, a bit more about the ongoing uh, CBDC projects uh, throughout the world before uh, analyzing the digital yuan uh, per se. 80% of central banks in the world are already working in CBDCs, according to a report published last year in January by the Bank of International Settlements. When I say working on CBDCs, I mean something as initial as doing some initial research. It doesn't mean that all those central banks are already testing the, their CBDCs in the same way that China is doing, because no country as advanced as China right now. It just means that they are working on that, sometimes maybe by doing some initial research or by being about to start some tests, like for example, uh, Korea and Japan. So as you can see, it's a wide concept uh, when I say working on. And even though CBDCs are attracting interest like all around the world, Asia seems to be the place in the world where CBDCs are arousing much more interest because aside from China and its digital yuan, there are many more ongoing projects such as the CBDC tests that we are going to see starting soon in Japan and Korea. Also, um, those tests involving the Hong Kong Monetary Authority in Hong Kong, aside from the digital yuan, like for example, the project that we used to know as Intern on Lion Rock, which has been rebranded now, but still uh, also, um, Thailand, Cambodia, Philippines, Vietnam. So as you can see, Asia is like the place in the world where CBDCs are attracting much more interest. And talking about Asia, the place, the country in the world, which is more advanced when it comes to CBDCs, is China with its digital yuan. And to make one remark though, when I say the country which is more advanced, I'm talking about the major economy, because there is one country in the Caribbean, the Bahamas, which already rolled out its CBDC called the sun dollar last year in October. But the Hamas, I mean, despite being, of course, an important country, it's not what you call a major economy. So this is why when I say that China is the most advanced country in the world, it is so, but I'm talking about major economies and CBDCs. So as I said uh, before, China started to finally test the digital yuan last year in April and May after six years of research. The digital yuan is also known as DCEP, digital currency electronic payment, or sometimes it is also referred to as ERMB or ECNY. So anytime you see digital yuan, DCEP, ERMB or ECNY, we are actually talking about the same idea or concept. So as I said before, DCEP has been introduced by the People's Bank of China, which makes sense because it's a CBDC and the PBOC is China's central bank. And it's going to operate, as we saw as well, through a two-tier monetary structure, which I already mentioned before. So I'm not going to dwell on this part anymore. Um, the CP is going to have uh, several advantages, actually many more than those that I listed out on this slide, but those were like the main ones, uh, according to, to me at least. Um, but out of those four advantages, there is one to me that is super important for China, and this one is the fact that it's going to allow China to create an important soft power tool. And especially, it's going to allow China to try to deploy the digital yuan for cross-border payments. And this idea is very important because China has never managed to use, to, to challenge the dominant position of the US dollar when it comes to international payment, international transactions in international trade. They, China, the Chinese government is trying, is attempting 
to try to change somehow this situation through the use of the digital yuan. Some challenges are going to remain. The digital yuan is going to remain a non-convertible currency because the, the yuan is going to remain non-convertible. So there are still many issues to solve. But it's, it looks like, well, it might be possible for China to convert some of the US denominated transactions into RMB denominated ones, thanks to the digital yuan. And to me, that's the, the, the main key or rationale behind uh, China, rather than uh, financial inclusion or any of the others that I listed uh, before. So where are we now when it comes to the digital yuan? Well, uh, the digital yuan has been tested so far uh, only in mainland China, and it's been very successful with those tests. But the Chinese government is going to start testing the digital yuan as well in China's two special administrative regions, Hong Kong and Macau. The tests in Macau and Hong Kong especially in Hong Kong, are going to be very important because they're going to allow China to test for the first time the digital yuan for cross-border payments. Because as you know, Hong Kong's currency is not the yuan, the RMB, it's the Hong Kong dollar, which means that in, that in that sense, for those purposes, it's not the same as testing it in mainland China. So that's why the tests in Hong Kong and Macau are going to be so, so important. Where are we now? Well, as I said, those tests have been increasing um, like in importance since, uh, since the moment China started last April and May. They started by some uh, minor tests in those uh, four cities I mentioned before, uh, Suzhou, Chengdu, Xiongan, and Shenzhen. And those tests are currently being extended to, well, when, when it comes to, to including more people and a higher amount of RMB into those tests. And we, for example, seen those uh, massive uh, digital yuan giveaways or lotteries in some of those cities. And as you can see on this slide, the amount of people and money involved in those lotteries has been gradually increasing. And so far it's been a, a success. As I said before, the interest for China to test the digital yuan in Hong Kong and Macau is the fact that it's going to allow China to test it for cross-border payments. And one might think, how can you be so sure that China's main rationale is to use the digital yuan for cross-border payments? Well, that was actually at first just one theory that I and many other uh, scholars and people working in that area had. But I think that that uh, thought is going, it's becoming much more clear and real every time whenever we saw China's latest movement, like for example, the People's Bank, Bank of China signing that um, agreement with uh, SWIFT, the, the payments company, you know, uh, you know this kind, or also uh, China signing the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. All those movements show us that China is actually envisioning and trying to extend internationally the digital yuan to some extent. I mean, I'm not saying that the US dollar is going to lose its uh, dominant position overnight because this is not going to happen, but still, there might be some some challenge. This is why the US has finally decided to start analyzing the idea of uh, doing research on a digital US dollar as well, even though before they didn't want to, but they cannot uh, let China be so advanced and then they not do much about it. And just a couple of final remarks about digital yuan. The transaction speed is, as you can see, very fast and uh, it's going to support offline payments and that part is uh, very important. Too. So in order to conclude, and I think I was uh, brief enough, China, as I said before, if the CP is going to prove viable, which I'm pretty sure it will, is going to become the first ma major economy to introduce a CBDC. Many other countries are following China's lead. I must say though that China didn't invent CBDCs, of course, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that China being so advanced has somehow prompted many other countries to speed up their tests and research because they don't want to be left behind. So China didn't invent CBDCs, of course, but China being so advanced is acting as a well, as an impulse which encourages other countries to move faster. And last but not least, um, China is, as I said before, envisioning to use the digital yuan for cross-border payments. And I think that, uh, for example, the RCEP free trade agreement is a clear example because it's going to allow China to have this huge free trade zone where China is going to be able to deploy its digital yuan to, in order to try to convert some of the US dollar denominated transactions into RMB denominated ones. So that's the end of my talk.
talk. I think it was uh, brief enough. Sorry for going so fast, but I wanted to cover sure. a lot of topics. So let's move to the Q&A session. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. This, this was impressively an amazing presentation, very, very informative. And uh, my, my question to you is, 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 is this, right? So with China being so advanced right now and, and being at the forefront of implementing uh, the CBDC, uh, what do you think that after China, do, 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 you, do you see the U.S. being, being following that trend immediately after or the European market? Or uh, do you see that this is something that the African market can, can certainly implement to fast track the adoption of, of the digital economy? I mean, we, we so want, we certainly see the difference between uh, digital currency or cryptocurrency and the CBDC, which is definitely centralized. It's not necessarily crypto, but it is running digitally. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that African countries can certainly also follow that, that particular leap and, and implement? Where do we see this trend going from here? Sure, definitely. I mean, we are seeing many other countries uh, doing research on, on those areas and, and, and testing CBDCs. Uh, Europe, for example, the European Union uh, is going to decide in April if they want to finally move forward or not. I'm pretty sure they will. But still, even if they do, they said it's going to take them from two to five years to effectively like roll out a digital euro. So it takes years. No? I mean, China started in 2014. Uh, um, the US, uh, I mean, are going like even much more behind than, than, than Europe because they haven't like even properly started. I mean, they kind of right. rejected this idea until now. Uh, when it comes to Africa, I think that actually Africa should tap into this opportunity much, much more than any other area because um, among the, the several reasons that, that I said that are interesting for CBDCs, there is one which is financial inclusion that to me is key. And I mean, I don't think that a digital euro is going to make a huge change, for example, for Europe. Because, yes, I mean, it might change in some ways, but I don't think our lives are going to change. But when it comes to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, in those countries where so many people own smartphones and laptops, but sometimes because they live in remote towns, they do not have access to, to physical bank branches. It's in there where both sure. the CBDC and virtual banking can make a huge impact. And I think we are going to start seeing African governments trying to, well, to do research and, and implement this idea. And, and they should, because it may... It, there might be a huge difference between doing and not doing so. Beautiful. Beautiful. Dr. Oriel, thank you very much for your contribution to this uh, session. Thank you very much.